Okay, so it's my pleasure now to um, introduce our president, um, Graham Kerr, uh, for the annual presidential address. I hand over to you, Graham. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of talking today as holder of the President's Office of the New Zealand Grassroots Association. And I guess it's sort of an open platform today and I thought I'd like to talk about something I feel strongly about with the NZGA. It's really why I joined the Executive. And if I had to sum this up, it's science and objective thinking. For our association, science is an integral part of who we are. And it's mentioned in the bottom line of the slide. You read it. Fueled by science, tempered by experience. And at present in the global world we live in, science is under fire as never before. It's being misquoted, misused, misunderstood. On TV, Radio, social media, we hear that magic phrase all the time, a new study has shown. And this, as you know, can lead anywhere. A classic example is that from the Huffington, Huffington Post. A glass of red wine is equivalent to an hour at the gym. Now, this is great news for some of you who may be thinking, we had a great workout last night at dinner. <laughs> but of course, this simply is not true. What is true is this is science behind the story. But then it was taken, as often happens, to a non-existent, erroneous conclusion. The study in question was done at the University of Alberta published in the Journal of Physiology and is on a compound, resveratrol. And resveratrol was found largely in the skins of red grape. The media reported this, which included a video, which I pictured there on the slide, with footage of a chemistry lab for and for authenticity, but overlooked the following four points. Firstly, the trial was done with rats. Secondly, there was no control. Rats were given resveratrol or not, but both groups were exercised. So the soft trial didn't actually have anything to do with exercise as a treatment. Thirdly, the trial didn't actually use red wine, it used the supplement. And fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, the level given to rats in the trial was equivalent to each of us drinking between 100 and 1,000 bottles of red wine a day. <laughs> So I think most people would agree would have side effects on your health. While this is humorous, it's also a sad commentary on where some of our science reporting, and I say science in inverted, inverted commas, is nowadays. And there are many such examples. I'll give you a couple more that um, I found, which I found uh, quite interesting. Six-year-old Croatian boy has turned out to be magnetic. Metal objects stick to him. He can, uh, he can put this out. It was actually responded to in Nature, in a journal, um, where the summary uh, uh, scientist pointed out, if Ivan had indeed been magnetic, he wouldn't have needed to bend slightly backwards to keep the item stuck to his body. <laughs> Nail polish makes you fat, based on a wild extrapolation of a study of the chemical triphenyl phosphate. There was one I was quite taken with, a warning by the PETA, People from Ethical Treatment of Animals for Pregnant Women. And I quote, The latest scientific evidence shows that the sons of pregnant women who consume chicken are more likely to have smaller penises. <laughs> hard to believe. In this age, it's hard to work out what is exactly right or wrong. For example, coffee, for which I am a self-professed addict. 
Oops, no backwards. Here are 21 claims of why coffee is banned for you. Linked to early death, rising blood pressure, heart disease, tense in the young. It, it goes on and on. Out of interest, I looked at number 21 because I thought that was a little bit strange. I thought, in, impaired hearing loss, recovery from hearing loss. So I dug out the paper on that one. It was a one by Zawawi et al. in 2006 in a trial on 24 albino <laughs> guinea pigs, which were played loud music and given 25 milligrams of caffeine a day, which by my calculation is equivalent to me drinking around 14 double espressos. Um, and while this may seem of limited relevance, relevance um, given I don't drink 14 double espresso a day and I'm not an albino guinea pig, the situation becomes more confusing because here are 21 claims why I should drink coffee. <laughs> it reduces pain, increases fight, etc. So it's no wonder the credibility of science is being questioned. Should we throw science away? And the answer is definitely no. We need good science and good reporting of science and in turn, we need the NZGA more than ever before. The pastoral industry needs the science base for developing knowledge through good, objective thinking and methods. I hope one of the reasons you are here today is because you also believe in the importance of this in this very spin oriented current age. So what does this mean to us? And I've chosen three principles I think the New Zealand Grassland Association does well around science and objective thinking to mention in this talk. Firstly, qualifying statements. Many of you have presented papers at our conference, but for those of you that haven't, how about it? How about presenting a paper? I can tell you from an agribusiness point of view that setting up trials with a paper in mind means a more rigorous process around trials, aims, design, right from the start. The peer review process of our journal gives you a framework of objectivity and teaches you how to reference. And that's important that you quote someone correctly, provide an orderable trail for the comments you make. It allows others to source the quoted work and understand its value. For those of you that haven't done a paper, have a look in the back of the proceedings, page 287, and you'll find how to do it. The second thing, good controls. And in this industry, we work in biological systems where we have a myriad of complex actions and interactions. So we need good controls as a standard of care against. So we can, oh, otherwise we draw the wrong conclusion. A nice example of this was a hoax article, and this was a hoax article put out by um, Matt Parker, but it's a nice illustration. This article he put out online, and it, he was interested to see how it would be taken up by the, taken up by the media, was that mobile phone masks are linked to mysterious spikes in birth rate. And he's a mathematician, so he did all the maths on it and worked out a regression line with correlation, <coughs> correlation coefficient of 98.1 out of 100, which means there's a 99.99997% probability of this being a real effect. In fact, for every extra mobile phone mask in Britain, there are 18 more babies born. Amazing statistic. The problem he was highlighting was correlation and causation. As he explained, as the population of an area goes up, so do the number of mobile phone towers, and so do the number of people giving birth. Birth rates are correlated with cell phone tower, but it's the greater number of people that cause more births, of course. An analogous sample we come across in our industry all the time is farmer trials. 
Where do we undertake a simple trial? Where we have a treatment, whether it be a fertiliser, seed mix, some sort, subsoil, or some other treatment, where it is applied in one paddock, but not an adjacent <coughs> paddock to provide a control. Then we hear there's a difference between paddocks. And we're told that this treatment, whatever it is, is better. Which is correct, but it jumps to the conclusion that it's the treatment that's the single factor causing the difference, not one of the myriad of other differences and in interactions that occur between <coughs> patterns, both historic and ongoing. A smarter design would be the split patterns, where the control is included within patterns. Here, if you have a paddock effect, such as rain and pugging the cattle, you now have a pugging trial on one of the paddocks, the cross street. But still, there may be a need to get smarter still and more objective. And some more sophisticated trial designs provide greater replication in a smaller, more homogenous area with better control of man management interactions. So it's really looking at what we need to provide the data. <coughs> and lastly, the number of trials. To get a robust result, Given the variability in biological systems we work in, we often need multiple trials. This was well explained in a paper by Doug Edmeads and McBride in 2002, looking at the cumulative frequency. This is figure one from the paper, and it presents a set of over 25 experiments assessing the effect of a crop yield of applying a negligible amount of water. 225 litres of water per hectare. As expected, the mean <coughs> effect of overall experiments was about 0% change in yield. However, individual results ranged from 22% decrease to a 32% increase in yield. So this is an interesting paper to study in terms of the need for multiple trials to give robust results. So when you consider trial data, it relates to what was found in those specific conditions. Further trials may need needed to confirm the result, tested under different conditions. And while it's impossible, while it is possible to hypothesize what results might mean on a wider scale, we are aware of the extrapolation of data in the places it doesn't cover, as in some of the examples we've seen earlier in this presentation. So really, in conclusion, in a world where our new study has shown can lead anywhere, we need science and objective thinking, and we need the New Zealand Grassland Association more than ever. When you look at data, among other things, look for qualified statements that you can check, good use of controls, and the right number of trials to provide a robust result. The New Zealand Grasslands Association strongly supports science through this conference and its journey. In this post-truth age, my wish is you in turn support your association in this role and like me, be promoters of science and objective thinking in our industry. Thank you.